Coming up, Ross Anderson makes history being inducted into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, holding the American record for speed skiing. We're talking all things prey in our studio with producer and artist Jane Myers. And we meet the woman preserving the precious history of the Sisseton Wapiton Oyate. Those interviews plus headlines are next on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Amidawahopa, thank you for joining us. I am Alia Chavez. We start in South Dakota, where Governor Kristi Noem has been banned from the homelands of a tribal nation for the second time this year. The Cheyenne River Sioux Tribal Council voted 12 to 0 to ban Noem from its reservation. In January, the Oglala Sioux Tribe president also banned Noem. Cheyenne River officials say they were angered after Noem showed up at a quarterly Pesh law meeting in March, uninvited and unannounced. Noem has made several allegations about their tribe tribes being involved in drug cartels, mismanaging federal funds, and having poor education. Nome's communication director, Ian Fury, responded, telling ICT, banishing Governor Nome does nothing to solve the problem. In South America, the fight to stop illegal extractive industries is still going on. One autonomous nation in Peru is continuing that fight by making their voice heard. ICT's Daniel Herrera has more for us. In Galilea, located near the Peruvian Amazon, people were awoken with chants of hundreds of Wampis people filling the streets in protests of mining. The Gobierno Territorial Autónoma de la Nación Wampis has said there are more than 35 illegal gold mines in their area. In territory Wampis, hay presencia de. In Wampus territory, there is a presence of illegal mining, illegal logging companies, oil companies. An example is the oil extraction area 64. A press release from the autonomous Wampis Nation shows that they found five illegal excavators in one of their communities with armed personnel protecting them. These mining companies use mercury in their processes, which pollute the Morona and Santiago rivers, both which have been a lifeline to the Wampis since before the Spanish conquest. In a briefing by the Wampis Nation, they said mining is only part of the picture of extractive projects affecting their land. El Peru, sigue de Peru continues to destroy its forest despite international commitments to take care of the forest. The Amazon, the Peruvian government continues to destroy the Amazon in many ways. This is why we are protesting. Wampis representatives said illegal mining has attracted other illegal economies into the area such as drug and human trafficking. According to estimates by the Ministry of Energy and Mines, Peru produces around 100 tons of gold per year and another 40 tons are produced illegally. For ICT News, Daniel Herrera Carvajal. We go now to Hawaii, where $700,000 in grant funding will investigate the state's climate using indigenous approaches. Scientists at the University of Hawaii at Manoa will study Hawaii's communities and ecosystems that are particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events like flash floods and wildfires. The National Science Foundation grant will be used to conduct research that uses both scientific and traditional Native Hawaiian knowledge to learn about the climate. In New Mexico, a new redistricting map serves as a win for Navajo citizens. In 2021, the Navajo Nation sued San Juan County for its attempt to dilute the voting power of Navajo voters. The county's old map packed Navajo citizens into one district, suppressing their voting power and ability to get policy priorities for local seats. The lawsuit was recently settled by the county, and a new redistricting map was created, ensuring equitable distribution of the Navajo population through the 2030 census. According to the Attorney General of the Navajo Nation, Ethel Branch, the settlement serves as a win. 
Well, March Madness continues on. That's as the University of Utah star Alyssa Peely is entering the 2024 WNBA draft. In March, the Samoan and Inupiaq forward broke a record for the most points made in a single season by her college's history at 692. She has been a fan favorite with many native folks driving hours to see her play in person. In a statement on social media, Peely wrote, I deeply I deeply appreciate the endless support from both my Polynesian and Indigenous communities, and I will always continue to represent my people proudly. Current predictions have Peely being drafted in the first round as an 11th or 12th pick, and the draft will be televised from New York on Monday, April 15th on ESPN. Speed skier Ross Anderson recently became the first Native American person to be inducted into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. ICT's Paris Wise spoke to him on his life, career, and what this incredible honor means to him. It, this is kind of like the highest honor for skiing sport, period. And being the first ever Native American Indian to ever be inducted, you know, I think that's going to open up a lot of open up a lot of doors for our next generations, our next leaders, that they know there are no boundaries and they can do what they want. And so I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. And, you know, it, it, you know, hopefully that path will guide them to, to better things. Well, you happen to have skied at over a speed of over 150 miles per hour. What does that even feel like? I can't understand it. <laughs> So, you know, when it, and it's kind of hard to explain, especially if it's, you know, a person that, that never skied before or, you know, has gone maybe 80 miles per hour on a car, but it's really, it's, when you're in that zone, when you're in that mentality of going that fast, you can actually slow your body down. You can slow your brain down to the point where you're seeing in front of you slower things than it really is. Um, so it's kind of like the inner outer body experience of kind of seeing yourself in third person in a way. And it's the coolest thing ever because you you can see what's kind of in front of you. It's kind of like paint playing chess. So it's kind of like that where you have two moves ahead. You always think about two moves ahead. So you two, two moves ahead, you're seeing what's gonna come next. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, the track is a little bumpy, you already, know what you're going to be doing you can you know can work with it you're not working against it but you're working with it and it's probably the coolest thing ever uh, the sensation of going that fast because that's 123 miles an hour which is terminal velocity that's somebody falling out of a plane like just literally free falling so we're going faster than that and yet all we have is a helmet that's aerodynamic it's your only protection at that point and you're only a foot and a half off the ground and you're on these 240 skis which is about eight feet long skis and that's it so um you really have to be confident in what you do and and you know take everything with stride and, and it's one of those uh things where you just got to get out of that comfort zone and that kind of helps you out to identify who you want to be next you have openly shared that you were adopted by a white family how has identity played a role in your life? Of course, in the beginning, especially when you're so small and you're so young, um, you you kind of feel like you're not don't belong there because you're not seeing what you see in the mirror, and and then compared to what your family is, and, you know, it it took me some time. You know, it was, I guess it was more like um, middle school is when you start to identify you know you're you're different and you know you have different peers that are not the same color and it's, you know, especially in Durango being more dominant in a Caucasian uh, town it was um to me it wasn't you know to the point of um really make that difference with them to me they were just friends yeah, when you get older, and then you start kind of seeing the difference and things. And but then, 
and you get your challenges as well, but um, you conquer those challenges and you stand up for what you believe in and who you are. And, and uh, you know, it, it took some time, but um, you have to find that uh, right identity for you to really strive to go forward. What would your advice be to someone who wants to do something they've never done before and maybe have never seen anyone they can relate to in that space? Well, I mean, it's just you never give up on what you do and what you really feel and truly feel you, you know, don't, you know, don't listen to others because um, it's, it's, it's you yourself who's going to make that decision by um, proceeding for what it is you're going to be doing, either studies or, or academics, uh, you know, athletics, um, or anything like that, government, you name it. Um, you can, you know, just make sure and, and take that stride and, and understand that ours is going to be, um, it's going to be difficult, but you stick with it no matter what. What are some other things that helped you along the way, or were there any people who inspired you? Well, I mean, it's really you yourself who who's going to be the one who's going to inspire yourself to do what you um, truly want to do, especially if there's really nobody there that um, you kind of looked up to. I mean, in the skiing sport, it's really kind of hard for me to to identify anybody, you know, like, you know, the Olympics was there and, and the athletics were there and the athletes were there, but there was really no one person that's just like, hey, you know, just because you did it, I'm going to do it. It was more of, well, I want to make that path and I want to be the first one. So, you know, when it comes to that, you have more determination than your normal person who would look up to somebody, I think. And, and you're basically paving that way to to make that uh, dream and make that a uh, that uh, path. Well, Ross Anderson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. One day, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, Indigenous communities will likely look much different than right now. That's why we've launched a short series called Indigenous in 2024. Here we will interview the changemakers of today about their reflections, observations, and hopes. Our conversation today is with Jane Myers. The Comanche and Blackfeet creative won several awards for her role as a producer on the science fiction and action movie Prey. Jane Myers, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. So a lot of people know you for your role in the film Prey. And it's been some time now since that film has been out. And when you think back and, and think about the significance of that project, what are the ways that you think it pushed the needle forward for Native representation? I think it pushed the needle for, I've been uh, producing for nine years now and mainly documentaries. I've done nine documentaries, but I, I can do everything. You know, recently I worked commercially for Ralph Lauren and Naomi Glasses for her collection. But I think it moved the needle because it showed that Native people have a place everywhere. And that's kind of my, uh, I guess my mission, because in film I want to change that uh, archetype that wasn't made by us you know, and show our real history, show the beauty of our language, show the beauty of our culture, and it can stand out anywhere, even in space. When you think back to being on set and production, what do you remember most about the, that time period? Uh, the time period was right during the pandemic, so we shot in Canada when the border was closed, so we had uh, visas, there were only 10 of us that were from the U.S., and I had been like on lockdown just like everyone else, and if you see the film, Prey is shot primarily outside, we didn't really do any studio shooting. So for me, it was great because I got to be outdoors every day and they're like, we're going to have to snowshoe up to the top of this and see a view. I'm fine. We're going to have to uh, put on waders and walk across this very cold river. And uh, it was great. And just to like uh, the native actors that were on it, like um, Amber Midthunder, you know, just to work with her and keep her motivated and just think about when she jumped in that river, that water was like 45 degrees because it was melted snow water that was 
uh, coming down the river. So just to make something that I think was so basic and just, um, I feel like Prey just took it back to the beginning, look like how Predator was. It was just good entertainment and exciting, not like a lot of um, uh, digital stuff and vampires and et cetera, so. Has there been a reaction that resonates with you most to that film that came from an indigenous person who maybe said like, holy cow, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. What reactions have you heard? When, um, when I first got the script and across the top it said all uh, dialect, I mean all uh, language in Comanche, I mean all lines, I was really excited because that hasn't really been done. So I wanted to make something that my people, uh, the Comanche people, could be proud of. I wanted to inspire little kids because when I grew up, I saw nobody that I knew that was indigenous, and the Comanches are always misportrayed. So um, I wanted to make something, you know, where if you, yes, you can be a superhero. You know, Amber Midthunder's like the first native superhero and the first woman to actually lead a Predator franchise. There has never been like a, a woman protagonist. That's amazing. I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about um, something really serious to indigenous people. As a storyteller, what do you think is the single most pressing issue for indigenous people in this day and age? Oh, a lot of things. We have environment still, you know, uh, food challenges. Uh, we even have um, justice, you know, as well as, you know, climate change. Uh, I'm currently working on a documentary on Leonard Peltier. So that is a story that a lot of people your age, I mean, you, you probably know of him, but like the world doesn't really know of him. And it feels good to be back in that dock area uh, because I work among like many different types of uh, media. So, um, but to be back in documentary, this is my ninth documentary and to have that contact with Leonard and to try to amplify his case and shed a light, you know, that's worldwide. I, I mean, to me, that's really important because a lot of people don't know that history. I think that sort of blends into the next uh, question, which is the flip side of that. What do you think is the greatest strength of indigenous people in 2024? I think the greatest strength is we all support each other. We all do, and um, I just saw a designer when I was leaving my hotel to come here, and she's like, let me know if you want to dress in anything. I said, I'm going to something now. I should have seen you earlier. But just to know that you know we have those platforms and we do support each other. I think that activism is taking a really um, different turn because just seeing the history of uh, the Peltier story, if you look back in the 70s, we weren't equipped like we are now. You know, we didn't have Indian Collective. We didn't have the, you know, people in uh, working for the administration in the White House. You know, we didn't have this kind of power. So just to have that and to be able to put it into a film, because film is very powerful. You've talked a lot about your roles um, in this industry, but I want to ask you about what could be your most important role, and that's as a mother. You have <laughs> incredibly talented children, so tell us about them. Oh, yes. Uh, well, my children are amazing. Uh, so you went to school with some of them, so I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. Uh, Philip, Philip Bread is a model in New York, and if you look at the recent uh, campaign with Naomi Glasses, he's our hero model, which is, means our, like, main model like Quana was. And so uh, he's been doing a lot of work. And and then uh, fast forward uh, to Pishon Bread. Pishon Bread is my daughter and she's amazing. She's a producer and a fashion designer. She'll be debuting uh, in May in the Native Fashion Week in Santa Fe. And then Wakeya Jane. Wakeya Jane is an incredible artist. She's a ledger artist. And her work is, is phenomenal. And she, like she's in, um, Oh, I forget what museum it is in, in New York. And so she's, you know, like her work is in private collections and not just in the native sector, but outside of the native, native sector, which I think is important. And I think that's how all of my children work. They're traditional native people, but yet you see them mainstream on large platforms. And then my last, last and my oldest daughter is uh, Valencia Eve. And she's incredible. She has a Medi Spa in Texas, so she's responsible for this. <laughs> That's what I was telling her. She's like, you spend too much time outdoors. And I'm like, I can't help it. I'm making films outdoors. So. Yeah. As a mom, what does it feel like to see all of your children thriving in these ways? It's, it's the best thing. Uh, I raised them all in the powwow circle, and we're traditional people. I raised them our Comanche way, even though I'm Comanche and Blackfeet. So for me... Um, 
as a bead worker and a, uh, I make regalia and they all had like museum quality regalia when, when they were little and they all grew up in the powwow circle, you know, and within our culture. And I think that's really important when you have that because once you have that as the basis for who you are, then you can jump up to these big, large platforms. But for me, it just makes me proud. I'm just, you know, I grew up, uh, they, they grew up watching me and I told them they could do anything. And so now they're out following their dreams and doing and everything and anything. So it, it's kind of incredible just to see that and uh, it makes me very happy. Absolutely. Well, Jane, we thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Arabe tuat tavai, which is yut for today is a good day. Arabe is today, tuat is good, and tavai is day. Arabe tuat tavai, which is yut for today is a good day. Tribal historic preservation officers tell stories of their nations through archives and cultural knowledge. Our partners at SDPB, Brian Gevick, shares more on the Sisseton Wapaten Oyate's Tamra St. John, who cares deeply about this history. Sisseton is located near the center of the Lake Traverse Indian Reservation. Approximately 12,000 members of the Sisseton Wapaten Oyate live on that reservation, which covers most of Roberts County and stretches into six more counties, including two in North Dakota. Tribal history is preserved in the stories and artifacts that are passed down from one generation to the next. A branch of the tribal government is working to archive those stories and artifacts. And as SDPB's Brian Gevick learned on a recent visit to the reservation, an understanding of the tribe's past may be the key to understanding the tribe today. This is the Sisseton Wapaten Tribal Administration Building, and this is where our current archives and uh, historic preservation office are housed. This building also includes like our tribal court. Tamara St. John is the historian, archivist, and curator of collections for the Sisseton Wapaten Oyate. She learned about the history of her tribe and culture mostly from her elders and not so much in school. Most of us have grown up in an education system that talks about history, American history. You know, history began when Columbus arrived. And uh, for us, you know, it's our own history. We tell our own history now. When the Dakota were pushed out of Minnesota and relocated to the Lake Traverse Reservation in Dakota Territory, they found evidence of earlier native occupation in the form of burial mounds. They knew that they were among relatives. These are the resting places of our ancestors. Now, anthropology will often identify those places as being uh, like Mound Builder or Oneota Mounds and some of those things, but for us, um, we know them to be places where the Dakota held them to be sacred and continued to bury into them. Archaeological digs done at the end of the 19th century unearthed metal buttons and even rough caskets that could only have come from relatively recent burials. Many artifacts were removed from the mounds and shipped off to museums. Sisseton and Wapaten, since uh, the early 1990s, has been involved in bringing back thousands and thousands of the remains of our relatives that were taken from the burial mounds here. Tamara St. John believes that understanding what happened to Native peoples in the past is vital to understanding why things are the way they are for them in the present. The things that we've gone through, the fact um, that we have survived so much uh, is really important because it results in this sort of devastation and the social issues and things that you see today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. St. John has been a Republican member of South Dakota's House of Representatives since 2019 and serves the four northeastern counties that include the Lake Traverse Reservation. 
So as a legislator, I often am sitting in a committee room and we're looking at data, whether that is the suicide rate or poverty rate or whatever it might be. We look at those things and how those things impact our finances, but we don't look at how things became that way. And I think that's an important point. So there are times when I've had uh, people in this very room and sharing history and one uh, real well-known individual had asked me, you know, Tamara, what do you want me to take away from here? And I had told him, you know, I want you to understand that when you look at us and when you look at the, those sort of things, like the social ills and things that you hear so often about, that you are witnessing what is the devastation of us. And what's happening now is our recovery. Um, we have survived in a really amazing way, and here we are. St. John and others would like to see a new museum that could attract more visitors coming to the reservation. It's a way to share our history and to, you know, expose others to some of the beautiful things that I think it is to be Dakota and uh, not just rely on others to share our stories. That is a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit us at ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.